I'm going to now pass it on to Paola, who's going to do an introduction. But before we do the introduction, Dr. Lisa, I just want to give uh, you know a sense of who have been the uh, uh, speakers in the past, Julie, for the Adson lecture. These are a lot of people that you're familiar with. Ali Kadim Hussein, you may not be familiar, but he is uh, considered the best disciple of Bob Langer out of MIT. He is uh, the uh, president of the Tassarak Institute right now, doing amazing work. But everybody else you recognize in this picture. So let's see. Um, Paola, you want to go ahead? Yeah, of course. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pulitzis. Uh, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing you. Uh, so Dr. Pelitsis is the Dean of Charles E. Schmidt College of Medicine, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Professor of Neurosurgery at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, prior to joining uh, Florida Atlantic University, Dr. Pelitsis served as a Division Chief of Functional Neurosurgery and Chair and Professor of the Basic Neuroscience Department at Albany Medical College in New York. As Chair of the Department of Neuroscience and Experimental Therapeutics at Albany, Dr. Pilitsis oversaw departmental teaching programs, including graduate school research and outreach programs such as community service, translational research efforts, alumni relationships, and development. Together with a colleague, she designed an, in, uh, an interprofessional MD-PhD um, uh, nursing analysis health uh, team-based master's degree curriculum in clinical investigation. Uh, during her tenure, the department's for grant funding increased tenfold. Academic productivity, as measured by publications, but has increased fourfold, and graduate students who self-identify as underrepresented in medicine have increased by 30%. Uh, Dr. Pelitsis received a bachelor's in biology, uh, graduating ma magna cum laude in 1996, and her MD with distinction um, from Albany Medical College. Uh, in 1998, she participated in a six-year combined bachelor's MD program with um, AMC Troy. In 2002, she received her PhD in, in physiology from Wayne State University in Detroit and completed her residency and internship in the Department of Neurosurgery at um, Wayne State University uh, from 1998 to, to 2006. She completed a fellowship in functional neurosurgery from Rush University Medical Center in Chicago from 2006 to 2007. And Dr. Blitz has recently received her MBA with concentration in health informatics from Fayette State University. These are some of the publications uh, from Dr. Blitz's to the field. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, publications um, in functional neurosurgery, of course. And if you would go next, we can see his, uh, sorry, her um, age index and all the, 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 the citations uh, she has received over the years. And this is, uh, Dr. Blitz, this is the uh, plaque that we're gonna send to you uh, because you're presenting with us today in a special lecture, which is the Atson lecture. And next please, Dr. Q. And today, Dr. Blitz is gonna talk about, um, or her title, her talk is titled, Can Fo Focus Ultrasound Change the Pain Game? Thank you very much and welcome, Dr. Blitzis. Julie, thank you for being here. And you can see what a tremendous honor it is for us to end the year with this amazing uh, lecture from you and to have you here with us. We're very, very honored. Thank you. Well, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, I'm tired just looking at all the great things that you have accomplished and um, you should be really proud. Uh, it, it's clear that uh, Q has developed a great team um, with all of you contributing to the mission and um, you really have something very, very special. Uh, thank you for sharing that with me and, and inviting me to be part of this. Um, you know, today I'm going to talk a little bit about focused ultrasound um, and, you know, I, I think that focused ultrasound has become a very hot topic, even more so over the last four or five years, um, but I liked uh, focused ultrasound before it was cool to like like focused ultrasound. So I think you'll find this, you know, um, sometimes you have to wait for when the timing is right of what you're doing. Uh, and sometimes you find that along the way. So I've been involved in focused ultrasound since about 2006, 2007, um, when uh, I came right out of fellowship and uh, started working. Uh, 
Here are my disclosures. The only one that relates at all to this talk is uh, I have a startup company around um, the data that we collected in our competitive renewal on uh, neurosurgical robotics. So, you know, I wanted to start a little bit by talking about pain. Uh, you know, when we have uh, all the sections that we have in neurosurgery, you know, we talk a lot about vascular, we talk a lot about skull base, sometimes chronic pain gets forgotten. And um, this really is a... Uh, is epidemic in America. So if you look at um, the numbers in hot pink, right, that's 116 million uh, Americans that suffer with chronic pain. Look how at the size of that compared to cancer, heart disease, and diabetes alone. It's really staggering how many people this affects. And, you know, for me, these are the patients I see and um, work up and treat. But for all of you, you know, when you're seeing the neurosurgical patient and when you see that comorbidity of chronic pain, you know that the hospital course and um, really the perioperative course is going to be different than what it is when somebody does doesn't have chronic pain. And that's something that we all have to consider and think about. So, you know, there's a number of uh, current therapies for chronic pain. And of course, you know, like anything in um, neurosurgery or especially spine, uh, when we're caring for patients, we start with the things that have the least amount of side effects, uh, the things that can be reversed and, you know, have benefit with uh, uh, the best risk profile. So oftentimes with medications, physical therapies or alternative therapies, uh, I'll I'll often see people that, you know, have had many of these things and haven't delved so much into the physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, mind-body intervention. I don't know if the same is true in Jacksonville, but it's been very refreshing as I've come down to Boca that people are very open to these techniques and alternative therapies. And really that has, um, it, it's changed a little bit of the way I practice. And then of course you get into more invasive things starting uh, at the bottom with injections um, and then we can talk about ablation and then eventually into neuromodulation and you know what we started looking at was what about focused ultrasound and where could this fit in this treatment paradigm so I divide this kind of into past, present, and future of focused ultrasound in particular, starting with the past, which isn't quite the past, um, but, you know, in the way that we're thinking about things, we may consider it as such. Uh, so focused ultrasound has first garnered attention um, for the treatment of essential tremor and hot off the press, uh, I'm not sure if you have a focused ultrasound system there. Um, not yet, I think. <laughs> not yet. We're working on it, Julie. That's, that's what we're going to collaborate next year. 2023. Awesome. Okay. Well, there's so much we could do um, in a variety of things, but, you know, uh, focused ultrasound um, has been, it first came out of the gates as a treatment for essential tremor. And, um, you know, this was some exciting work out of the UVA group where they looked at, um, you know, whether this was effective. And we all know that deep brain stimulation is extremely effective for um, essential tremor, probably about 80% pain relief. And with focused ultrasound, we see similar. Um, there is some room for improvement uh, for reasons I'll talk about later in the talk. But, um, you know, this is where much of the attention has been spent. More recently, uh, this has garnered approval for Parkinson's disease. And um, just last week, uh, focused ultrasound became approved for bilateral treatment of essential tremor. So this is um, really something that is being used. Um, again, uh, you know, it's very interesting in terms terms of where you practice and how things uh, change. You know, I started my career or my training in the Midwest for a decade and found very different things than when I went to the Northeast. And now coming down to Florida, things are very different. Uh, so in, uh, in Albany, the average age of my Parkinson's patient or the hospital Parkinson's patient was about 60. Here it's about 80. 
So um, you have to think about, you have to reframe what you're thinking about. And, you know, assuming that you're and you and Jacksonville are having similar uh, demographics to we are in many ways, this really um, is a nice adjunct to have for your therapy because of the older age of the population. And I think, you know, that we're going to probably have both demographics as everybody virtually from the Northeast has my and everywhere has migrated to Florida, but also we're we're always going to have that steady stream of retirees. So I, I think just, um, you know, uh, for Q and when you're talking to the hospital administrators, I think the economics of focused ultrasound looks different here in Florida than it does elsewhere, because I think it'll be more used. So what about focused ultrasound for pain? Um, this is pretty interesting. There, there's been a couple of studies uh, out of Europe looking at uh, create, using focused ultrasound for pain. And this, again, is the ablative technology. So um, for those of us that were around in the day of pallidotomy and thalamotomy, this is kind of the uh, newest way of doing this. It's easier because it's uh, external. So that's much more appealing to patients. Patients. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't involve brain surgery, well, per se. Um, so I think that has changed uh, the way we think about this. Um, for focused ultrasound for pain, it's interesting that, uh, again, any study that happens in pain is, is really hard, and it's really hard to make clinical endpoints, because these are the patients that are the worst of the worst. They've inevitably failed a number of primary surgeries. They failed, uh, you know, spinal cord stimulation, they fi failed pump, they failed, you know, even things like the deep brain stimulation or motor cortex. So these are the hardest of the hard patients to treat. Another aspect of this is that the phenotypes of pain patients is not well worked out. Uh, if you have one patient with complex regional pain syndrome and you have another one, they are very different patients. So, you know, looking at better ways to phenotype these patients will be essential to have better data in the pain space. Having said that, you know, there were some patients here that did have benefit uh, from having focused ultrasound. This interestingly was bilateral central thalamotomy. So a little bit, um, uh, uh, gives us a little bit of pause um, when we're thinking about doing this bilaterally. And before this moves forward, you know, I sat on a uh, working group consensus panel about this work. We need to understand some of the cognitive um, aspects of, of what could happen in those cases. So where are we now um, with uh, with focused ultrasound and what what can we do? And this is talking a little bit about um, a multitude of uh, our research projects. So um, that we have introduced, um, you know, kind of as a intermediary step between uh, the focused ultrasound that is delivered externally within an MRI suite and um, pallidotomy, we have uh, created a needle-based therapeutic ultrasound probe. And how is this better or different? Well, the problem with the external probe, especially when you're thinking about brain tumors or when you're thinking about, um, you know, things close to the skull is that the ultrasound waves reflect from the skull. The problem with both um, external HIFU and pallidotomy or radiofrequency lesions of the past were that you could only create a lesion that was ovoid or spherical. And it thus, you know, again, if you're thinking about really shaping this and what's right for the patient, we have lots of data about what may be right for the patient from the work that's been done in micro electrode recording and the work that we're gain, uh, garnering from directional leads. Well, we have no option to use that when we think about the new ablative technology because we can't conform the treatment. So th this is something that, that we came up with. And, um, you know, when you're thinking about this, you have to think about, okay, so now I have this probe, how is this delivered? Um, when we're talking about doing any of the MRI guided procedures, uh, we know that there's some urban ergonomic 
economic challenges. So lit, for instance, and, you know, everybody's found a different way to do laser therapy. Um, I can tell you the way we've done it is we've done the surgical aspect of it in the operating room and then brought the patient to MR to do the thermal imaging and create the ablation. Uh, whether you're doing that, you know, that way or whether you're doing it in an intraoperative MRI, the ergonomics of, um, of some of these MR-based procedures is still a bit, little bit lacking. So what we actually did, and you know, this is um, how we introduced the therapy and actually got into ultrasound, was we created an MRI compatible robotic system. This, uh, this system can not only uh, perform uh, surgeries in the MR suite, but it can also, you can take images while the system is working. So, you know, I think for some of the, the junior people in the room, I just wanted to touch upon the, how we, um, how this all came to be. So I came out of, uh, I got my PhD during a residency and, and the way that was built into our residency program, it was one of two residency programs at the time that had a PhD built in. And it was in years uh, three and four of my residency program. I had another four years of residency and a fellowship to go. So I was a little bit removed in, from this. And, you know, I, I wasn't competitive for, uh, the K funding or, you know, I didn't have preliminary data to use at that time. So I kind of had to start afresh when I started um, in my own practice. And I, I tell that story because, you know, well, now when I give this advice, I, I the, the future clinician scientists, I tell them I'll, to do it a little bit different than I did. So I end up at, at University of Massachusetts and that's right down the road from uh, WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. There was a young robotic engineer who just came out of Hopkins and had a prostate robot that was MRI compatible. He and I hit it off. And the next thing you know, we were designing this robot to replicate the uh, Lexel frame, except to be able to do this in the operating room. And, you know, it was funny because he already had his uh, robot geared for the urologist. And what I learned is the demands of urology are much more simple compared to the demands of neurosurgeons. I know that's intuitively obvious, but we like our, we like our toys and we like to play with different things. And, you know, so when he he was showing me how kind of simple this was. I was like, okay, if you want to make this big, we have to make this a little bit more um, sexy for lack of a better word. So, you know, this was our um, MRI. This was some of the images that we took first in Worcester. This was, is all MRI compatible. It's funny, you know, you would get a screw off the shelf that you thought was MRI compatible, and then you would take images and this did not go well. We've made this so this can all travel in a carry-on and we've made it compatible with different MRI systems. So this is um, more recent uh, when we were testing this uh, MR. I think, again, you have to, you, you all have Mayo Clinic and all the wonderful things that come along with being involved in the Mayo system. But, but also in Jacksonville, you have to think about what your competitive advantage is, who you can partner with. And so right near us in Albany is GE Global Research. So we started working with them. Um, um, in the second uh, in the second five years on this grant. And so here is again what the system looked like and um, we really fine tune this to the point that we've uh, we've done about we've done surgery in about 25 different swine. So this is a picture of our robot in action. Um, there are seven degrees of freedom for this robot, and um, this allows us to align things perfectly. As you may imagine, you know, just another uh, quip to talk about. And you know, I'm sure um, though uh, Dr. Q and I can tell stories about um, you know how our careers went, especially once we were in academics. They're much more circuitous than the stories that we tell. And so here we'd actually designed this robot to um, put in uh, put deep brain stimulators in. And when we went to get funding, they said, "Oh, you don't need to do that. Surgeons are good enough at this." So you know that's actually how we got involved in ultrasound. And so here were some of our initial. Uh, 
images on workflow. Um, you know, we would make the burr hole. We would use this as a, a, a means of developing entry and target points. We'd insert the cannula. Eventually, we were inserting the applicator. Um, we improved our MR thermal imaging, which I'll show on the next slide. This is our post-operative MRI. And so here's our histologic analysis. Um, another, you know, for those of you that do animal work, we don't have all the fun toys oftentimes that we have in the operating room. So you might see that edema on that post-operative image. That was because we were trying to add gadolinium to, and we were trying to create like a, a poor man's um, Duracell with some gadolinium. And whatever we did, we caused an inflammatory change. So we got rid of that and the inflammation stopped. So what, as I alluded to, one of the issues with um, the focused ultrasound to date is some of the limitations of MR thermal imaging. It, it, you want to know how big to make the lesion, but oftentimes you're looking at one um, MR slice, and that is inaccurate. What if you pick the wrong one? What if that's not the image that has a lot of different uh, data points on it? And what if the patient moves or changes things? Or you know, so we have actually worked with our colleagues at um, GE to uh, improve MR thermal imaging. And I think this, regardless of everything else we're doing, will have a meaningful impact on the field in any application because this allows us to. Create create more accurate lesion size that will help those ultrasound patients have more long lasting results because right now we want to be safe and we don't create the lesions as bigger and the right size as we can but this technology will help with that and of course, you know, this keeps us honest by doing ground truth analysis. Wanted to touch upon neuromodulation. Um, you know, it was funny because people said, uh, you know, say, Julie, why did you start with an invasive device with all the cool stuff that's going on externally? And, you know, again, this was because I got involved in this field in 2006. So th the game changed. And, um, you know, you have to figure out ways to continue your research program while kind of changing with the game. And so, you know, I, I had talked to uh, our ultrasound engineer and like any good ultrasound engineer, uh, he had multiple things in his garage. So these wands at the bottom of the screen um, were, you know, from the late 90s, early 2000s, he had actually had a project where he was trying to use external ultrasound to reduce wrinkles. And so we started looking at this ultrasound device to see if we could use this externally to neuromodulate tissue. Now, why would I want to do this? Well, you know, uh, this ultrasound, again, is a thing of, uh, it, it's uh, antiquated and looks like something from the 80s and 90s. But office-based handheld devices are still what is done in the field of pain. So if I want to neuromodulate something, um, you know, you think about what our pain colleagues do. They do injections. They do things they can do in the office or their ASC. They very rarely work in an MRI, if ever. And so we wanted to come up with something that would um, maintain the workflow that our colleagues need in the pain space. And so we started looking at um, um, a treating pain with low intensity focused ultrasound. Um, again, we uh, we thought about what we could do. You know, there's spinal cord stimulation that would have had the largest market um, uh, of people. I've gotten a little bit smarter here in my field because you know I think when I started, uh, you know, learning from that experience about okay, there probably aren't enough DBS cases to warrant that robot. I would have loved to go for spinal cord stimulation, but when you're thinking about ultrasound, there's the problem of bone. So we didn't start there. And, you know, for similar reasons, we didn't start with the brain, but there were peripheral nerve stimulation. And um, then as this therapy evolved, people started talking about dorsal root ganglion stimulation. So we started first with peripheral nerve stimulation. And where did we start with chronic migraine? Um, this was an interesting experience uh, for a variety of reasons. We implanted cannulas in the epidural space and infused them with um, things that make your head hurt. 
hurt uh, for about two weeks. Problems were, interestingly, as we went along, um, you know, this was before the Grimace scale came out and other adaptations were made. Reviewers didn't believe that we could uh, give animals a migraine. Another problem, and you know, this is something that we took into con in consideration with our pig work too, is that anatomy differs from animal to animal. So in, you know, when we're talking about the occipital nerves in humans, this is very different than the one in the rat. So we moved on to dorsal root ganglion stimulation. So, you know, this is a procedure that, again, that had come out in the time that we were developing this technology. Here you see these DRG leads. And if you look at the dorsal root ganglion stimulator leads, you can see that some are under the pedicles and some are coming out um, uh, into the, the nerve roots that um, are lateral. And so our thought here was, hey, if people are having such great relief with DRG, is there any way that we could use kind of a X-lift approach and get at least where the tail of these DRG leads are. And so we started doing this. First in rats, um, you know, normally you would use kind of a uh, nerve ligation model higher up on the sciatic nerve, but since that's where we wanted to go with our device, we wanted to leave that ter uh, therapy or that region free. So we went a little bit further down and did uh, common perineal nerve ligations. Then we treated uh, this with low intensity focused ultrasound. And again, and we're not trying to ablate the nerve here, we're trying to modulate it um, in order to make sure that we were hitting the target. We used nerve conduction recordings further down. We did some behavioral testing. We used ultrasound and C-arm to make sure that we were getting in the right place. And ultimately we did histology. The first thing we did was a comparison of our internal versus external uh, focused ultrasound. And we monitored this, you know, another problem with pain studies in animals and rats is that we have to use markers of pain, which are allodynia, which only compromise that sensory component of pain. Um, but be that as it may, we saw similar results to our internal device with our external device. So that was very exciting for us. Another question came up was, okay, so you got ex you got results and you reduced allodynia for three to five days, depending on your model system. Uh, interestingly, dependent on sex too. Um, the, the female rats had uh, responses out till seven days. Then people said, okay, if you do it again, what happens? And so we showed that there was no tachyphylaxis. I do think that this nerve conduction study aspect is um, essential because in pain studies in particular, it, but all studies, you want to make sure sure that you're actually hitting the target. Um, we then started looking at other things to try to understand the mechanism. Why would a three minute treatment with this device give five days of response? So we began looking at plexon recordings as well as uh, looking at systemic cytokines and ion channel um, uh, reporting. And this work is ongoing, um, but you know uh, what I really wanted to talk about is not the basic science aspect and the mechanistic aspect of this, but rather um, how do we get this to people? So we showed in both sexes across three different rat pain models that we had a meaningful response. What's the next step to get this to people? Well, then we pivoted to a large animal model. And, it, the, and we picked swine um, for a variety of reasons, but it was interesting. Um, you know, our animal facility had the most capability to do swine. We then looked at the literature and found that while farm pigs had been involved in some type of pain, they hadn't been involved in neuropathic pain, which is what all neuromodulation targets. So we first had to develop a pain model in pigs, which we did. And then we had to develop the probe. So that original probe that I showed you was capable of going to a couple, uh, you know, maybe a centimeter deep. But as we're going into pigs, we needed to make sure that our probe was able to go that depth. So, you know, we had to do some work with our engineers in order to reach that depth. We also had to make sure that um, we were hitting the target. And, you know, this is actually where we use C-arm uh, and ultrasound. And of course, we did ex vivo, vivo studies uh, prior to doing this in what, of course, but cork one.
And so we had a similar pro, uh, paradigm as we did in swine, um, the exact same thing. And um, this was fun because this got not only my lab involved, but all the residents involved in that, um, you know, for the swine, especially the swine that we were going to survive for 30 days, uh, we needed to really make sure that sterile technique um, was uh, uh enforce and um, that we took really good care of these animals. We wanted, we would have kept them longer for 30 days, but one of the problems with working with swine is they become so big that after 30 days, they're a three person lift. So I wanted to show you this video and this was one of our swine that we did early on. So we probably, um, you know, tied the, ligated the nerve a little bit too tight because you'll, you'll see a little bit of a, a motor um, response, but the experience exciting thing here is, so this was the animal's response. So you see, it's got a little bit of a foot drop. And uh, when he he's going into, um, you know, when he was playing with the other pigs, that what would happen was very similar to humans, um, the pigs guard. So think about your broken arm, you're going to guard it away from anybody hit. So this was pretty cool, because now not only did we have allodynia as a metric, but we had these pigs guarding and showing more human behavior. And what happened after, again, a single three minute treatment using this probe, um, we were able to give back function as well as prevent guarding. And that lasted for 30 days after this treatment. So we're really excited about this technology. So was NIH. We just received one of their, the seven blueprint grants they awarded, which is a way to commercialize this. And now they're having, we were there in the pilot program, they're having their second phase. So moving this forward. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, I, I can't give a talk on focused ultrasound and not mention blood brain barrier, um, especially with the cool stuff that you guys are doing with uh, nanoparticles. Um, you know, I think this has uh, real potential for um, changing the game, in, especially in neuro-oncology, but of course in pain and looking at um, the drugs that we may not have considered before in the past. So in summary, um, focused ultrasound has been utilized uh, in neurosurgical applications. Uh, what I, I'm trying to do in my whole lab's research progress has uh, been on is to make um, care better than it's been for our patients by improving what we deliver and improving the tools that we use to do that. Uh, I really appreciate yeah, you all taking the time. And, you know, I, I think it is important to, to know that, you know, when we're thinking about the pain patient and when we're helping to treat them, um, they're always going to have some component of pain. But if we could just give them a little bit of relief and help their suffering, we really have done our job. Huge team um, that goes into things. Uh, these are our most recent aspect of the team. Uh, you know, I think in many ways, Dr. Q and I are cut from the same cloth. We've had, I've had about 150 students going through this lab and playing roles like many of you are today. Um, keep, keep doing it because, you know, there's nothing more rewarding than doing this all together. Uh, happy to take any questions and um, anytime anybody, any of you want to come visit, I'm only about four hours away um, and, you know, just as lovely as where you are uh, up there. Thanks so much for the invitation. Dr. Pilitsis, thank you. What a beautiful talk. What a tour de force. What an amazing way to illustrate a dream, a idea, and uh, not giving up, even though everybody is telling you potentially won't work or we, the neurosurgeons are as good as a robot, which we are not. I mean, we just, we know that uh, if you had the right coordinates, if you had the right uh, paradigms, you know, there's a reason why this technology is amazing. I'm going to have Dr. I think, uh, did I see you know, Dr. Grewal right here, who is going to lead a discussion with Q&A. Go ahead, Sanjeev, lead it, lead it please. Uh, absolutely, thanks, Dr. Q, and, and thanks, Dr. Pontus, for such an excellent talk. Uh, I have more questions than we have time for, but uh, to, to, to start with, uh, you know, you were talking about uh, conforming our lesions uh, and the invasive probe that you, you designed. You know, the natural thing I think of initially is just our limitations with lit and you know the curvature of the hippocampus is this probe intended to allow uh, curvilinear ablations 
Great question. Thanks so much. So yeah, it's, you know, I think we, we actually, um, you know, are, are funded through uh, NCI. And so, you know, our target disease uh, was brain metastases. Having said that, so what we have in our probes right now is um, they're almost like a directional DBS lead. So we have four different sectors um, where, where we can do this. So have we tried to do curvy linear? No, but could we? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's just working out the uh, geometrics of that. And um, I spent last week uh, getting 